So, how about we start? Okay. I'll do a short one on Nextcloud, but I think a lot of you might have been in other talks where I talked about Nextcloud. How many of you need to get the basics of Nextcloud, if any? One. one. <laughs> I'll do it quick then. And then I'll talk a little bit about encryption, and then I'll go into the requirements of our end-to-end -end encryption, um, the design of it, and the roadmap of where we're going. The design being the fun part. So quickly, Nextcloud private self-hosted file sync and share, uh, written in PHP, um, run on your own server, runs on any LAMP stack, a uh, lot of apps, it's very extensible, not only on the storage side, Nextcloud supports external storage, so you can um, use um, a NAS and mount it into Nextcloud to make it available, um, object storage, uh, FTP, but even Dropbox, Google Drive, and other stuff you can mount into Nextcloud. And then you get at your files via mobile apps for Android, iOS, uh, and of course via the web browser. And it's all open source. All your video chat, somebody asked me about that today, so that's a relatively new feature, Nextcloud 13. And it's essentially, it's WebRTC based, so in a browser you can join a call with multiple people. Um, the basic setup worked quite well with four, five, six people. You need a good LAN, then you can get to 10. So it's all peer-to-peer -peer and encrypted. So if you are in a call with 10 people, the call can be handled by really low-end hardware. So Raspberry Pi could run Nextcloud and host a dozen calls for each 10 people. That's really not a big problem. Uh, the hardware doesn't really limit it because you're all talking peer-to-peer. -peer. So the only thing Nextcloud does is help you set up the connections between the people in the call and then they have their call, right? It's not like with Skype or, well, pretty much anything else where the call goes via somebody else's servers that decrypt and encrypt it again, etc. cetera. Um, we have mobile app for it as well, uh, which has push notifications, if you have the right setup for that, which in practice means if Frank now goes on our cloud.nextcloud.com, our company, Nextcloud installation, and clicks on my face and says start a call, my phone will ring. That's where we are today. That's pretty cool, I think. That's fully decentralized conversations. You can send a public link to someone, they can join the call as well. Um, and again, all of it is open source. Run it for yourself. Um, and chat, it's not yet in the mobile apps, but it is in the web interface, so you also can have chat channels with well, multiple people as well. So it's a pretty nice new feature that maybe you weren't aware of. Now you are. Okay, I have a bit of a fun way of putting Nextcloud in perspective that I wanted to try out on you guys, see what you think. How many of you know these guys? <laughs> uh -huh. Everybody who is a little bit above or around my age, fair enough. Um, so these guys invented kind of the network drive. And there was a big thing in the, in the 90s when they figured it out, uh, as well as like users on the network. So what you have here, uh, all these computers that are connected on a network, you have a user directory, etc. These guys came up with it. And it was like a big boon for productivity in companies, right? It was pretty cool. Uh, 1993, I looked it up. And it's like the Network Drive 1.0, right? You have the user directory, you can work together at uh, one single company-wide drive that you all share. That's effectively what it is. And then the IT department, they can, they can like really say like, okay, this person has access to this folder, but not this subfolder, and it's like really granular permissions. Again, it's great for productivity. And then these guys came. I think everyone knows them, right? Um, the way I see it, it's kind of like Network Drive 2.0. Yeah? Instead of you have to be on a company network in the company building usually, you can actually just sync your files to your laptop and work on it even when you're not connected or even when you're at home. So it's really a step forward. It also takes away some of control from IT because the IT department can no longer set all these permissions because people just share this themselves. Now obviously this is also how Nextcloud does it. Uh, it's mobile, right? not just on your laptop but also on your mobile phone, which is really cool. So you basically get another productivity boost in part because suddenly work starts to encroach in your private life, but you 
yeah, that's how it is these days. And then these guys came. They made essentially another step, call it the Network Drive 3.0, which gives you all the same benefits, but you can actually collaboratively edit documents in real time with other people. And they are the chat and audio and video calls. Now you guess why I talked about the fact that we have that in network because in Nextcloud because we're working towards something here. Um, and again, just like Dropbox, by the way, this was mostly for home users. I mean, you can use, of course, the Google stuff in a company, and then companies, universities do. But it primarily started as a home user technology, which is, you know, a limitation in some ways. Now, I'm not saying we're anything like the other guys, because they're all a little bigger than we are. Um, but, of course, the difference with, with what they do and what we do is that, in our case, it's self-hosted, and you as a company or an individual are fully in control. You can do roughly the same things. We're working on the stuff that's missing. But, you know, you run it on your own server. That's one way of looking at Nextcloud. I'll skip uh, the other fun stuff. I like to make a comparison with how well Nextcloud has done but how far we still have to go, the flat red line is us. <laughs> it's just on <laughs> yeah, I mean, th this is nice, right? People go like, oh yeah, yeah, you guys have overtaken like the other, like even like Ignite and Acellian and um, a share file that's from Citrix, that's like a big company, right? And if you see a little blue line, like we've steamed past them, at least in terms of interest on the internet, which is Google, uh, Google search this, what you're looking at. Uh, so, you know, that's cool, and we're proud of that, but, you know, these are our targets, right? These are the guys that we're trying to replace, and, you know, we still have a long way to go. Um, as in, we barely got started. So, anyway, that was next slide. If you have any questions, obviously shoot. If not, then I'm going to go into the fun stuff. Fun? Yeah, All right. Excellent. Encryption. Why do you do it? How does it work? Or where is it? So the whole point, of course, of encryption is to make sure that your data cannot be intercepted or seen by others. Yeah, in, in general, it's, it's often important to, to have a threat model, uh, which, which in, in crypto or security means like a description of what it is you're trying to protect from. And we're going to talk about different kinds of encryption in Nextcloud because different kinds of encryption protect you from different things, different dangers. And it's, it's really important if you talk about security in general that you identify what are you trying to protect from. Uh, most of us can probably protect quite easily from, for example, an insecure Wi-Fi network. Uh, just use HTTPS and, and SSH and VPN. If, on the other hand, you're trying to protect from uh, the NSA, good luck because there's not much normal human beings like us can do to really protect from them. And a very different game, you need completely different tools if you want to protect yourself. Really from the NSA, get rid of your phone first, yeah, and try to find one that you can trust. There aren't a lot, if any. Um, I mean, Tor is really the absolute minimum you need for any communication. And honestly, I would just stick with a command line because a browser is just bloody dangerous. It's a completely different park, and every threat model and the accompanying security to address it comes with trade-offs. So the trade-offs and the choices we made are going to be a big part of this uh, presentation. So Nextcloud offers kind of three kinds of encryption, and the first one in transit, that's just HTTPS. And that's set up in Apache, and it protects your uh, data from being intercepted by whoever is between you and the server. So if you're on the Wi-Fi network like here, uh, the sysadmins will, if you don't use HTTPS, be able to see everything that goes over the network. As a matter of fact, anyone in this room could, because you all can just sniff the network and just see the packets that go over. And if they're not encrypted, it's very easy to just track that and to store that and use it or just know what's happening. Um, so just enabling HTTPS with Let's Encrypt, for example, on Apache or Nginx, that protects you already from this threat. However, then, of course, you have the server itself, uh, which you might want to protect against. Be uh, like what could happen there. For example, somebody could come and take your server physically, steal it. Yeah? Now, if you use encryption at rest or server-side, um, your files are encrypted on the server. 
and depending on how you've done it, in Nextcloud there are a couple of options there, uh, your data would be safe even though your hardware got physically stolen. And then the last one, the end-to-end -end encryption that I'm going to talk about most today, that we're going to look at the design for, is about uh, the client. And this is where the encryption takes place on the client, so your mobile phone or your uh, desktop client. And the threat here, the threat model is essentially, I don't trust the server. Either because I don't trust the server admin, or because I'm afraid the server might be broken in at some point. Um, but whatever it is, the threat here is the server itself. And with end-to-end -end encryption, you can still use Nextcloud, and the files are still safe, even though the server is not trusted. That was the basis on which we designed this. So, recapping it a little bit, uh, the in-transit is a pretty standard thing, I think you all understand. Uh, but the server-side encryption is to, you use that when you don't trust the storage. And there are two ways of using it in Nextcloud. Um, our server-side encryption can use a user key or a server key. So if you use the server key, then the encryption key that is used to encrypt your files is stored on the server. That means if somebody comes and physically takes your server, they have the key. The fact that the files are encrypted doesn't mean much if the key is on the server itself. Uh, this is obviously putting like the key to your safe on the safe. doesn't really help much. However, if you use external storage, as I mentioned earlier, you can use an FTP drive or Amazon S3 for storage. So then the key which stays on your server is on your server, and your physical server still, you need to trust it. But that Amazon storage will only ever see encrypted files. So actually, the server key encryption is very useful if you use external storage. So you don't need to trust the storage itself, as long as you trust your server. Yeah? We also have user key that you can use. It's a bit slower, it gives you bigger performance hits, and it has a couple of downsides with sharing. But what it does is it creates a key for every user that's unique for the user, and that encrypts the key with the user password, and then stores only the encrypted key. So as long as the user isn't logged in or hasn't given his password, and let's say, for example, the server is turned off and somebody steals it, then all they'll find is encrypted files and encrypted keys to decrypt them, which they can't do anything with. So in that case, even the server itself would be safe if it's physically stolen. However, if somebody would manage to break into a running Nextcloud server that uses user key encryption, they can observe what is happening, and if they're in there for a day or a week, they would be able to get at some point, you log in, and note that your client, your desktop client, logs in every 30 seconds to check for new updates. Yeah, they would see you log in, they can then find the key in the memory of the server, not saying it's easy, but it's possible, and at that point they have the key and they can decrypt the data. So a stolen server with user key encryption is safe. The long-term breach in a running server is not. This is still a scenario where server-side encryption doesn't help you. And that's why we develop client-side encryption. No matter what happens to the server, even if you don't trust a sysadmin, even if somebody breaks in and is in the server for a long time, your data is safe. That's the whole threat model and the whole goal behind it. Yeah, so an undetected breach or an evil sysadmin. I think a lot of you are sysadmins. There are evil ones, really. <laughs> now, I mean, just think of the scenario. Right? You're a big company, a multi-billion dollar company. You're, you're on the stock market. Every quarter, you're releasing financial data. Somebody who has access to that data can quite easily, you know, buy stock, sell stock, and then earn a bit of money to the side. So obviously, as a company, most of your data, you trust the sysadmins with. But this specific data might really be something don't want anyone to have access to other than the people in the financial department. Now, in Germany, the laws around human resources and, and privacy are so strict that we have a customer at TU Berlin, they told me that the HR department only works on paper, physical paper. They're not allowed to use the computers for CVs, for resumes, because that's private data and they're just afraid that it leaks and they would be liable for that. And they're waiting for end-to-end -end encryption for the HR department. Yeah, so that's a kind of use case for it. So now you know kind of why we want it and what the threat model is, so let's talk about the requirements that we defined. 
So we've been working on this, depends how you look on it, uh, technically we've been only been working on it for about a year, um, but people have been asking Nexus for end-to-end -end encryption for literally forever. And like, you know, Nexus only exists since 2016, but at the same time I think a lot of you are aware that the people working on it started in 2010 on OwnCloud, right? And people have been asking us from the early days on at OwnCloud, like, we need end-to-end -end encryption. And the thing is, we're building a server which has this really nice web interface, yeah? Now let me be really clear, you can't have a web interface and end-to-end -end encryption. Now it's being sold by some companies that's called snake oil. Because yeah? a browser is what well, we call it a client, but it runs code from the server. So you can't trust, if you don't trust the server, how on earth can you trust the code coming from the server? So if you would decrypt the files in the browser with code coming from the server, how do you know that that server hasn't been modified to just send a little extra piece of code that just sends the key to the server? Now, you can't trust the web interface, so you can't make end-to-end -end encryption network in Nextcloud and still have, you know, online document editing, uh, versioning, sharing in the web interface, all these features just are gone. So for years we were like, yeah, I, I understand you want end-to-end -end encryption, but you know, our whole product is about collaboration and commenting on files and this makes no sense. We would kill everything that makes that cloud so nice and, and useful for people. Until people started to tell us, well, yeah, but you know, there's a subset of data I need it for. Like the example from TU Berlin, the, the HR files, just that, or just the financial data. And for those data, I don't care if you can't share it or edit it online. Can't you just make something more limited that, that just, I pick a folder, this is end-to-end -end encryption, but the rest is not. And this is the direction that we've taken. Have your cake, eat it. So, as I said, from a security point of view, we wanted the system to basically protect yourself, you against a completely compromised server. Yeah, the server is just completely taken over by someone and your data should still be secure even though you have no idea that it has been broken in. So it needs to hide the content of the files, kind of obvious, but also the name. Actually, our server-side encryption does not do that. Um, it needs to use public key encryption uh, that can be verified. And it needs to offer confidentiality so that, that only the people that you want access, uh, want to have access to a file have access. Again, it sounds obvious, but... Uh, and it needs to guarantee integrity. That is, if somebody tried to modify the files, you should get warned. So the way it is now in our design is only if, well, the only thing you could do on the server, well, you could modify the files, then the user will just get an error and the files can no longer be read, or you could delete them. But modifications will be not noted by the encryption. And last but not least, we also want the protection from impersonation. So we have a kind of an identification protocol. I think we call it cryptographic identity protection or something like that, fancy word, but it's just a signed public key. So the server signs keys. We'll get to that um, later. Now about the implementation, we wanted to use common libraries. I mean, the biggest rule in crypto is don't make your own crypto. So we want to just use OpenSSL and basically well-known protocols, but they also have to be available on all the platform for use. Uh, so whatever technology we write has to work on Android, iOS, uh, Linux, Windows, Mac, right, all the platforms that we support, as well as PHP 7, because we already know how the conversations are going to go, because we've had these conversations in the past, yeah, a customer comes to us and says, I want end-to-end -end encryption. Oh, okay, so you don't want a web interface. Now, of course you want a web interface, then you don't want end-to-end -end encryption. So at some point we will probably be forced to figure out a way to decrypt in PHP as in on the web server. Yes, it kind of defeats the purpose, but on the other hand, there are probably valid use cases at some point, maybe. <laughs> Let's see. Another thing we wanted is to have a central recovery technology. Um, yeah, I'll get to that actually on the next, next uh, page. And we want to have a version protocol, so you know we can fix bugs in future versions of the encryption uh, protocol and, for example, switch to a different key mechanism or a different um, 
yeah, method of encrypting. All right. Um, so we made a, a fundamental assumption in designing this. Um, users are stupid. They make mistakes. Don't rely on the user. And we also made the assumption that the sysadmin is actually knowing what he or she is doing. I know that's also an assumption that's not always true, but you know you have to rely on something. Yeah, so you will find when we go over the design later that there are a couple of points where we could have relied on the user, for example. Yeah? Let users pick their own password. We don't, because users pick the name of their cat, or they will pick the same login as they used on Nextcloud itself, which is already on the server. So, you know, we, we try to design it so that even users who make mistakes, forget their password, don't do what you tell them to do, etc., still don't lose data and still don't break or don't compromise the security of the system. Uh, that means it needs to be easy, and yeah, there needs to be a recovery mechanism for the users, for their keys, without, again, compromising the security um, and yeah, the password handling. I mean, don't let them pick their password. Give them one. And it needs to be enterprise ready. So if you're a company and you, know, you have employees who have end-to-end -end encrypted data and the employee leaves the company, you should still have access to that data without help of the employee. So for that, we actually found a solution. Um, and there needs to be audit trail. Now, obviously, I've been discussing this uh, a couple of weeks ago at a meeting with uh, the engineers. They were like, this whole audit requirement is kind of odd because you, know, you don't know what's in the file. The only thing that you see is a file was created, the file was deleted. Sure, but you know, that's the whole point of auditing. There's only so much you know, of course, of the content, but you still know that this person had access to that file on that date. And if, for example, somebody leaked financial data, you will be able to go back in the audit trail and say, well, you know, that financial spreadsheet was uploaded on this date. It was shared to that person on that date and shared to that person on the other date. And it was leaked in between. Therefore, this person didn't do it. That one did. Uh, that's the kind of information you still can get out, even though, of course, you then need to know when that spreadsheet was uploaded. You can't see it in the files because you don't know the content <coughs> or the file name or anything else. Only kind of the file size. And we wanted HSM support, so a hardware security module. Um, some companies use that. They trust that. So we basically designed or wanted to make the protocol so that you could add support for uh, a thing like that. All right. So I talked about like trade-offs, right? So the thing we wanted it to be able to do was you can have one or more folders that will be end-to-end -end encrypted. Um, and you can sync them between your devices. And you can share them with other people. Kind of the basics, of course, of what Nexlot does. However, no web interface. I already made clear you can't do that, not in a secure way. Yeah, no trash server feature, no versions server feature. Uh, we, we might be able to facilitate that somehow, but for now we don't promise it. Uh, no search on the server, I mean, not surprising. No previews, of course. Um, you can't share with groups, and you can't share individual files. You can only share a top-level end-to-end encrypted folder. So that's, from a collaboration perspective, a more important limitation. It really works on a folder level. Uh, you can share with any number of people, you can remove them and add them, but groups are not supported. This is also a limitation, by the way, for a server-side encryption when you're using individual keys. It's one of the reasons why most people use server keys. The individual keys, well, you can't share to a new person unless you actually log in and give your password so data can be re-encrypted. It's the same problem here. Uh, groups are difficult to do with encryption. Um, at the moment, we don't have federated sharing, so I don't know how much you guys are aware of this, but Nextcloud allows you to share uh, from one server to another. They can talk to each other, exchange address books, and they can just share by entering the name of a person on other Nextcloud server. It's a really cool feature. We want to support that also with end-to-end. -end. We have not really figured out uh, how, but the guy said it's theoretically possible, so let's see. If I'm going too quick or too slow, please tell me, or if you have questions. On any of the specifics. 
So now getting to the fun part, the actual design. Yeah, these were all the requirements, what we wanted to do, why and how. Now I'm gonna go over with some pictures and, and, and more bullet points on how it was actually implemented. All right. So let's have a look at what happens when you enable end-to-end -end encryption for the first time. Yeah, the, the steps that go through creating an identity um, and adding like another device to sync with. So, we're creating an identity. Yeah, so, so you have your NextFlight account, you have your, let's say, your mobile phone, let's say we're starting on your Android phone. Um, you select a folder and you say, okay, uh, I want to make this folder end-to-end -end encrypted. Now the first thing we need to do then, if you don't have it yet, and we're assuming here it's a fresh account, is to create an identity for you, like a secure, you know, public-private key pair is of course a big part of that. So the client generates a certificate request for the server and a private key. The server signs the private key certificate um, and then the signed private key and certificate are stored in the device keychain. So we don't encrypt that private key on the device, we put it in the device keychain and we assume, and Android phones do that, that it is encrypted. Yeah? And still your responsibility to make sure that if your device gets stolen, that your data is safe. Yeah? One of the things in our design is we haven't talked about at all about this, this protection on the local device. That's because we don't do that. Yeah? There are tools for that like hard disk encryption on your laptop, etc. we don't do it. So if you lose your phone, well then all the end-to-end -end encryption doesn't mean much unless you've secured your phone, just to be clear about that. So now we have a signed private key stored in the keychain of the device. Now, of course, we've created a public and a private key, right? We created a key pair. And the public key, uh, which was also signed, we're gonna upload to the server well, first a private key. Give me a sec. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, so the private key needs to be synced to other devices. So how are we going to do that? Um, what we do is the client shows you a mnemonic. That is basically 12 random dictionary words. Now, we have a special dictionary for that with, I think, about 3,500 words. There are at least five characters or more. <coughs> They're all chained together, although we show them with a space in between. And we basically we show the user these 12 words and we say, this is your password. Now, obviously, we don't expect them to remember it. We do tell them to write it down and put it in a safe place, as in a literal safe, for example. But as you remember, we expect users not to do it, so we expect them not to. Yeah? We use this mnemonic to encrypt the private key and send it to the server. We also store the mnemonic on the device, in the keychain, which should be encrypted. That means that if you did not do what we told you explicitly to do, you can always ask your phone and say, hey, show me my 12 words. So, what we now have is we have the private key encrypted by 12 words on the server, which means other devices will be able to download it. That's, of course, what we're going to do next. We're going to add uh, a new device. And what the new device does is it downloads your public and private key from the server. It checks a certificate. And then it asks you for the 12 words so it can decrypt the mnemonic. Well, now, let's say you pick your laptop. So now you grab your mobile phone. You say, please show me my 12 words. And you type them in. That's a little laborious. So we are working on um, basically just showing a um, QR code or something like that, right? That's in the works, because technically that's just as good as 12 words. But for now, um, you'll still have to type in the 12 words. So at this point, then the mnemonic and the private key are saved in the keychain on the device. And you now have two devices that both have a private key and can therefore encrypt and decrypt data and both have your identity. And the server, all this time only got encrypted little files that the server can't do much with. Yeah, so we're still completely secure. So now let's create a folder, um, set up the end-to-end -end encryption for that folder, add some files. 
Um, so we do this in multiple layers. Yeah, the files are encrypted with AES256. Um, so for every file, we create a file key, and that is then uh, used to encrypt the files. And then those file keys are put in another file that is encrypted with your public-private key pair. So that if you had, let's say, a three gigabyte you know, VM file, um, and you share it to someone else, you don't need to re-encrypt the whole three gigabyte files and re-upload it. You just need to re-encrypt that file that contains the file key. And that's one of the ways in which we keep it a little bit performant for if you have a lot of people that you're working with. Um, so the server will only know the number of files there for and their approximate sizes that way. So let's show this again. Step one, we create a folder. And you do a right click or well, long click on your phone and you say enable end to end encryption. What then happens is a metadata file is created which will hold the file keys. But there are no files yet, so we start with an empty metadata key, a uh, metadata file. And for the metadata file, there's a metadata key that encrypts the values in the file. And this key is encrypted to all the public keys that will get access to the folder, which at this moment is just you. Yeah. Uh, then we use the metadata key to encrypt all the values in the file, which is basically now just like, hey, this is an empty folder with that and that name. The server does not know the name of the folder. Um, and the whole stuff is synced to the server. So when we then create a new file, uh, the user um, uploads a file in the folder. Uh, we generate a AES256 uh, key, use it to encrypt the file, put the key in the metadata file, use the metadata key, metadata file key to encrypt the file, and upload the file plus this file onto the server, which is what happens here. So the file is, uh, we create a random UUID as name of the file. That's how we put it in the um, metadata file. I went a little ahead of myself here. Um, so you get a files array in this metadata file. And in that array, you basically get UUID, actual file name, which is all gonna be encrypted, and the file key. And then all of that is encrypted with the metadata key. So later when we'll download, of course, we decrypt the whole bunch and then get the files back. So let's look at that. Let's look at accessing and uh, sharing files. So we can share files because we use public-private key encryption. We can share files without actually having to share passwords or you know, type in passwords. You can just share with other people on your server. That makes it a lot easier to do it. And we check the public-private uh, key combination, or we check the public keys. Um, and we use Tofu, Trust on First Use, uh, for the identities. So what you'll see is that you can't actually change identities once they have been created and other people have like, started to share with you. Uh, this is a limitation which is intentional, because that means if somebody hacked your server and then wants access to your files and tries to impersonate somebody, to then hopefully get your client to re-encrypt the files and make them available to them isn't going to work because your client's going to refuse to do that because they see, hey, that is not your identity, which was signed, after all, by, an, uh, by a certificate from the server. You can't get a new one. So to download a file, aren't we going to talk about sharing? OK, no, downloading. So we've just talked about how your mobile phone, for example, uploaded a folder with a file in it. Now your desktop client is going to download it. Yeah? So it downloads the metadata of the encrypted folder. It downloads the file as well and the folder itself, if it didn't have that yet. It uses its private key, yeah, your private key, to decrypt the metadata key. It uses the metadata key to decrypt the files array. So it knows the UUID mapping, the file name, and the file key. And then locally, it renames the UUIDs, the files from the UUID, to a file name. And it uses the uh, file key to decrypt the file. And now you have a decrypted file locally. I know it's like 
going quick, so please tell me if I should repeat something or, or clarify, you know? <laughs> All right. Actually, I actually have a question. Yes. Um, so you mentioned Android. Uh, did you say whether or not you have iOS support? You do? Okay. Yeah, so I have an iOS client, an Android client, and then a desktop client for Windows, Linux, Mac. And the publisher and the Apple Store is TWS? Uh, no, it's actually not next. It should now be Nextcloud, I think. Nextcloud. I think we uh, changed that. Yes. Yeah. But don't shoot me if I'm wrong. It could be that it's still not changed. I searched for it in the App Store just now. There's a publisher yeah. TWS. I yeah, I'm. It, TWS. I'm not. I think our normal. It's still TWS. It's still TWS. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. In fact, I, that I still hasn't the changed then. Yeah. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Okay, um, and, and you have to understand this is our design. Like, for example, I'll, I'll get to that in the roadmap, but for example, the sharing is just not implemented yet at all, neither on the server nor on the client, so that doesn't work. Um, so there's still stuff that's not done yet. Anyway, this is how it's supposed to start to work. So you want to share, all right? So first what you do is you look, if, if I want to share with someone, uh, my client will first look if I've already shared with that person, and to look basically for their identity, for their key, right, their public key. Uh, if it doesn't have it locally, it asks the server for it, downloads it, and then checks the certificate if that was properly signed. If that is the case, it will store this identity of this user locally in the keychain. That means next time it's just gonna look when I wanna share with that person locally in the keychain. It's not gonna ask the server again, and therefore if an impersonator put in a new identity there, not gonna work. You're not gonna get access to the files that I am sharing with that person because I already have you. Obviously, if your server is compromised from day one, then all bets are off. Uh, but what we're protecting against here is like, at some point, somebody broke in and controls the server for, let's say, three weeks until you find out. And in that case, they will not be able to get to any files, at least not if you already had shared before with someone. So, um, what you then do is you create a new metadata key for the folder that you want to share. Uh, so in the folder is this metadata file, and you generate a new metadata key, which you encrypt against the public key of you and the person you want to share with and whoever else it was already shared with. You use it to re-encrypt the metadata, upload the file to the server, and then you tell the server with the OCS API, the existing Nextcloud sharing API, that you share with that user. At that point, that user will get a notification, will then be able to download the folder in the file. They will be able to decrypt, of course, that folder with their private key because you encrypted the metadata key to their public key. And therefore, they will be able to decrypt the metadata file, get access to the file array and the file keys, and they will be able to have all the files the same way as you do. To delete a share is actually quite simple. Um, you tell the server, hey, I don't want to share with that person anymore. And then you create a new metadata key, encrypt it again, re-upload it, and you're done. Now, this means, of course, that the person who had access still has using the old stuff, but, well, they had already probably downloaded it, so that's not something you can do anything about. Uh, we can't. We don't do a remote wipe. And if you need something like that again, there are other tools that do it. It just means that any future files or any changes you do in the folder will no longer be accessible uh, to that person. Well, one of the things that's uh, in the design that I haven't really specifically mentioned: um, when you change a file, it's essentially a completely new file. So when you change a file, it gets deleted. A new file is created new file with a new UID, a new uh, file key, um, and the whole thing is uploaded again. So that means that for the server there's no way to even know that a file is the same as an earlier file. That's also why the versioning does not work. Uh, and also an attacker um, would not be able to make any inference between you know, these files. It does also make the auditing a little harder because you can't really track changes to a file. You just know something changed in the folder and that's kind of it. But that's um, yeah, part of the course. 
So this is essentially the basic design. I mean, you've seen the creation of identity, you've seen the encryption, uh, decryption, the sharing, and unsharing. So that's that's all the basic pieces of it. Um, I mentioned key recovery, so let me talk a little bit about that. Um, as I said, we expect individuals to screw up. We expect the sysadmin to know what we're doing, what they are doing. So we made a uh, recovery key uh, solution, an offline recovery key basically, because again, people leave or people lose all their devices and mnemonic. Now, if you lose your phone, your laptop, and your tablet, and you didn't write down the key or your house burned down, you're pretty screwed, even with the recovery key, but we'll get to that in a minute. So what does a recovery key do? So the admin can enable it, and it's essentially generating another public-private key. Um, the public key is put on the server. Um, the way we currently envision this, that you do this really offline, and then put the public key on the server. And from then on, all the clients will encrypt to this public key as well as every other public key who they give access to. Now, to be clear, obviously the user is warned of this. Yeah, so if you have a um, provider that provides you know, Nextcloud services and they would enable this, your client will warn you. Right? This should, is, again, not meant to be a backdoor, obviously. And at that point you can say, whoa, 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 whoa wait, I don't want that, if you don't. But it's for a company, of course, this is quite a useful feature. So I can take a suggestion. Yes. If you haven't already considered it, um, I would suggest an escrow service to have also a copy of the repository of the public key and separate entities. Uh, this is something any individual provider can do, right? We don't provide Nextcloud anyway, we only provide the software. Yeah. So if you're indeed a Nextcloud provider, um, you could indeed say to your users, we offer a recovery service, but it's put in an escrow to keep it safe. That no, makes I mean, a lot of sense. The key itself, to validate the key itself prevents forgery, prevents uh, masquerade. When a private, public private key is generated, mm -hmm. the public key is going to be stored, used, available for use. Yes. To make sure that the users can check yes. separately. That makes sense, yeah. So in our model, with the Tofu uh, model, so users would, of course, on the first use, they would download the key, it needs to be signed. If you have an HSM, you can actually have that sign it, which creates a pretty secure, um, you know, trust uh, relation. And um, it can't be changed. Right? Because then again, if the provider would decide or somebody would hack into this provider and they would want to change the key, the clients, at least of the existing customers, would refuse to do anything with that because they're not even checking for changes because they assume there are no changes by default. Um, what version of GUID generation are you using? Oh God, that goes a little deeper than I know. Um, all right, so users are notified, users encrypt into this public key, and you can only use it. So the, the key thing here to take away is it can only be used to decrypt data. Yeah? The mnemonic, if you've lost your mnemonic, as in you've lost all your devices that can show it, as well as if you wrote it down, the written down version, it's lost. And of course you could set up end-to-end -end encryption again, but remember, Tofu, everybody you ever shared with will not accept your new encryption key. So your whole account is burned. Uh, this is like the only thing the recovery is good for is to get back the data. It's still a pretty nuclear problem to lose all your keys. That's why, of course, every device is basically a backup for your key. Yeah. And you should really write it down. Uh, that does really help. Um, the HSM actually is kind of an exception here because it can be used to create certificates securely and it could, in theory, be used to create new identities. We haven't really worked this out yet, but uh, at least in theory this could, actually if you have a company, of course, you could use this as a trusted point to create new identity and then you could have modified versions of the clients that do check, but then check whether that has properly been signed by the HSM and I'm going to assume that even if somebody takes over the server that runs Nextcloud, they still don't have a way to abuse the HSM. But this is something you need to set up then properly as a company. 
Right, so where are we and where are we going? So as I said, work technically started early 2017 and we had a tech preview by the time it was September. Kind of a beta as part of uh, Nextcloud 13. It's, it's still moving, we're still uh, figuring stuff out and, and changing sometimes pretty basic things. Um, especially the synchronization between all the different like, clients is bloody hard. I think actually like two weeks ago, maybe even last week, um, we actually had a successful sync between iOS, Android and the desktop client. It's just been quite hard to get to that point because, well, OpenSSL using that manually, I mean some platforms have libraries, but especially the Linux, Mac, Windows, you have to use it pretty directly. It's been complicated, especially the desktop client has uh, gotten a bit of delay compared to our plans. But we just merged it in master for the desktop client. So if you build now from our master on GitHub, you build the desktop client, it actually has end-to-end -end encryption built in. It also has a list of known bugs. So again, don't put your confidential stuff in it yet, um, but we are getting there. And hopefully with Nextcloud 14 in a few months, we will have something that um, we can call 1.0, so. And that's also why we really welcome reviews, both of the code and of course of the design, um, because it's really, really hard to get this right, both from a design perspective and a code perspective. And, um, you know, this is supposedly one of the benefits of open source, right? Many eyes make all bugs yellow. So please have a look. You can find uh, information there. And if you have questions, time to shoot. Because that was it, really. Yes. So I I started with OnCloud, encrypted my data. Is there an easy way to migrate to? Xcloud? Yes. Or do I need to start over? Which no, is no, no. Um, no, you can. I mean, with the encryption, honestly, I mean, it has been an issue with upgrading. I'm sure you've you've noticed. So what I would suggest is to use the command line client to decrypt all the data, then do the migration and then encrypt again. But honestly, that's what I would have recommended to do with own cloud between major releases anyhow, because it's been, it's hard to get this stuff right. And well, we have a lot of fixes for that, so it should be quite good going forward, but I would do that for the migration. So migrating from own cloud to next cloud is as easy as upgrading from one next cloud to the next, which is pretty darn good. We have a special script that uses a new updater to help you in the process. Um, but we have to verify it for each major own cloud release. So if you're running 1008, you're gonna have some patience until we have tested it uh, and enabled the migration script to work. If you go to nextcloud.com slash migration, you'll find all you need. Should be good. Any more questions? Sorry, I kind of missed uh, uh, the question. You know what, how a user gets ransomware, encrypts all the data on mm -hmm. their own cloud. Is that still, that's still an issue? Or? Well, it's possible, of course. We have an app uh, called, very creatively, Ransomware Protection, which uh, looks at your files. And if it sees that there is one of these known files, like we encrypted all your files, .txt and shit like that, um, we'll stop the sync process, we'll give you a warning, we'll warn the system administrator, and then you can use the older version, uh, the versioning of Nextcloud to roll back your files. However, um, first of all, you need to have it installed. Second of all, we can't detect all of it because some of the um, ransomware does not put a specific file there, and that's the way we check. And in general, make backups. Because, you know, there's only so much you can do. Uh, another thing about um, know the ransomware is um, if you put your data on the file system, that can be snapshotting. That's one of the we do that. Mm. Here's anything else to change. For that. That's one of the nicest tricks, yes. Yeah. But that's a client thing. Yes? As I understand it, the, um, the plugins that do like contacts and calendars, uh, they're not encrypted in any way at all, right? They're like no, because of course all the clients don't support any kind of encryption. Right, like Android and, and iOS, they couldn't deal with an encrypted file from coming from our server, and therefore you would have to then build your own calendar apps 
for all these platforms and your own client apps and I'm not saying it's impossible it's just quite a can of worms that um, yeah, we're not yet ready to open. You know, we are only like 35 people, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we can't do everything. We try to do the most important stuff that really helps, you know, collaboration and security, etc. But some things are still, um, yeah, a bit off. Although we wouldn't have been able to pull off 1% of the shit that we've done in the last 18 months without the community. Eh? I mean, the 35 people is definitely amplified by a factor of 10 because of all the people who've helped us. I have some uh, some stories to tell about some of the things there. So kudos also to everybody else who helped us pull off what we pulled off in the last years. Uh, yeah. so one of the earlier talks on security, he said the average time for breaking on the server is discovered is 205 days. So that's why it is, right? Yes. I mean, that's horrible, by the way. Um, <laughs> But I can't believe it. Uh, and then another five years, I think, before they actually tell their users, I think, yeah, who has the record there? Um, yeah, that's that's kind of like how to make it even worse. I find that really awful. Like, you just can't trust the companies who have had a breach to actually tell you about it, which is just awful. I mean, that's just putting you at even more risk. Uh, luckily, there's Have I Been Pwned. Uh, do you guys know that? There's uh, Troy Hunt. Is a pretty well-known security guy. He's been gathering up um, like data leaks from breaches, which included like passwords, etc. And basically he put up a website where you can enter your email address or a password. And if it's in any of the leaks that he has gathered over the years, you'll basically be told you've been compromised. Don't use his password and your email go to your password on every site you use it. It's really awesome, and we actually build it into Nextcloud 1301. So in Nextcloud 1301, um, we have like settings for the sysadmin where you can say like, okay, you know, I want password from a users to be, I don't know, five characters and, you know, have a smiley and whatever. Um, and there's an extra button that says, check the have I been pwned database. So if one of the users is setting up their accounts, and they pick a password that is in the database, they will basically be told, sorry, not a valid password, pick another one. It, it's a small thing, but it helps, you know. Um, and it's, you should check it, because if you have passwords that you are reusing, and this is exactly the problem, right? The moment Yahoo got breached, and again, Dropbox and others have had breaches too, then these huge lists of passwords get leaked, and what crackers basically do, and the black hat hackers, is they put that in their like tables which they use to crack um, databases and passwords and stuff. So that just speeds up, because if it's a known password, it's gonna be much faster to crack it. Um, and just make sure you're not reusing a password that has been leaked, because you can be certain that it's in all these lists that are being used by uh, black hats to uh, hack into accounts. Uh, so it's quite a useful service. Have I been pwned? Dot com. Yeah. I think uh, Troy also registered a couple of common typos, so you know you'll figure it out. Any more questions? Yes. Uh, earlier you mentioned um, the possibility of rather than end-to-end -end encryption, storing per user keys on the server. Can yeah, the server-side encryption. Speak a little bit about um, how. Administrators would use that as opposed to the, the examples you gave for the end-to-end -end encryption. Yes. Let me um, go back to that one. Yep, yep. Um, so this is all about your threat model, right? You need to think about what, as a search system admin, you are trying to protect from. Um, and server-side, this is part of server-side encryption, and it's meant to protect against essentially insecure storage and or physical theft of your hardware or a breach that's detected quick enough. So essentially those three. So what the server-side encryption does is it creates either a server-wide key or a per-user key and uses that to encrypt all the files. So the moment the user uploads a file, it gets encrypted and stored on the storage. 
Now, if that is external storage, which is what, for example, pretty much every of our customers use, uh, like uh, Amazon S3 or another object storage or they use NFS, then the file is encrypted and then sent to the storage system, which means if, well, you can actually use Nextfile with this to store files on Dropbox, and they'll all be encrypted before they're sent to Dropbox, or even on Google Drive, or an FTP drive from school. Which is actually quite nice, because you know these guys do offer really cheap storage. The problem is that you know you're paying for it with your privacy. Well, that problem is solved if you use Nextcloud to store your files there. Um, you can so and this this works best with a server key. So then the files are, as I said, encrypted on the server by the server with the server key. So if you make a public link and you share a file with, let's say, you share a gallery of photos with your family. The, the photos actually reside on Dropbox. Yeah? So a family member will open the link. What then will happen is the Nextcloud server gets the files from Dropbox, uses the key on the server to decrypt them, and then show them in the browser to you know, the family member who wanted to see the files. Yeah? Uh, so again, Amazon has no access, or Dropbox or whatever, has no access to the files. They see the file name, by the way. I think I mentioned that already. We don't change the file names, but they don't see the content. And I mean, img underscore number dot jpeg is not that, you know, doesn't give away that much anyway. Um, then you can, uh, so what it doesn't do is if somebody then breaks into that server, they can just grab the key, which is on the server, and then use that to decrypt all the files on Amazon S3. So it offers some protection, but it's limited. Now you have an option to enable individual key. And what then will happen is that for every user, an individual public-private key is generated. And that uh, key will then get encrypted with their login password. Now this, this, this is what you use then. I guess and you do use it with a server key or a private per user key. I think it's a user. Yeah, so that, that creates a bunch of like extra complications. So first of all, if you then do a public share of a file, well, if you're not logged in, the files can't be decrypted. So files that you have shared via public link actually get encrypted to the server key again, because otherwise your family members wouldn't be able to see the files. So there's already kind of a hole in it. It's, that's also one of the reasons why we just don't recommend people to use it, because it has too many complications. <coughs> Another thing is, if you share with a group and the admin asks a member to the group that you're not logged in, then your files can be made available to that new member because they would need to be re-encrypted with your key and your creed is encrypted with your password. So you need to log in first and then the server can re-encrypt the files and make them available to the new member in the group. So it's another pain point. Uh, that doesn't work if people don't log in or they're on holiday and you can then say, oh, I share with you, but it's not going to work. Um, and of course, if you lose your password, you lose your key and, you know, there needs to be a recovery mechanism and guess what, that usually ends up to be something, you know, via the admin on the server and there's again kind of a hole in it. So, it, in theory, the individual key uh, protection helps in case the server is physically stolen because the system will be off and everything is encrypted uh, but there's a bunch of caveats including anything shared with a public link is encrypted via the key that's on the server so it's useful but you still kind of need to trust the server basically the only good use case for it I wouldn't use the individual keys at all because with the performance drawbacks and the complications, it's just not worth it. I would use a server side key, and then you can trust that your external storage cannot be like you know compromised. But you still have to trust your server and keep an eye because when they break in and they stay in there for 200 days, you're screwed. <coughs> now, if if you're worried about that, use end-to-end -end encryption. Yeah, what I would like to solve is uh, data at rest when users aren't logged in. Yeah, well then this is good enough. Essentially. Um, and if you're using the uh, user keys on the server, yeah. I guess then you can still use the web interface without yeah, yes. the use yeah, yes. of the specific yeah. Yes, the server-side encryption. So essentially, I mean, what happens is...